Hi, James Clements here. Today I'm going to quickly go through uh, integration management, one of the nine knowledge areas in the uh, PIM box. Integration has seven processes and uh, they're listed here. And the first three processes, management plan, scope statement, charter, are all planning uh, processes and the others are executing. So today I'm just going to concentrate above the line on the planning aspects. There's two aspects to integration. One is the integration with the external environment of the project and the other is the internal integration of all the parts of the project. So to address the external aspects, your project is not an island. You don't sit out there doing everything differently to the rest of the organization. You don't have your own currency, you don't have your own people, race, rules, religion and so forth. Your project is more like this one. It is connected to the mainland, it's still its own project, it's still its own entity, but it must take you know, all its rules, regulations, currencies and so forth from the mainland. So it needs to be complementary. So you should not try and set up your project to be totally standalone. Doing this will just cause all of your project team members a whole bunch of grief because they have extra work to do, work that already exists within the organization. And when they start to exchange documents backwards and forwards between the project and the information, if they're different, then that's going to cause you issues. So you need to think long and hard about doing things differently. There are times when this is required, but think about it first and you know, be smart, use everything that exists because your project team has got enough to do anyway. The other aspects are all the internals of the project. Once all of the bits and pieces of the project are thought about, sized correctly, uh, complementary to each other, then you're gonna to start to create some synergy within your project when all of the bits and pieces tied together. So you've got nine knowledge areas within the PMBOK. All of these can be set up as standalone process, processes and, and uh, tools and monitoring and so forth. But when you get them all working together, when you draw some, some uh, framework through the middle of them that, that ties them all together, that's when you're really going to start to get your effective effectiveness in your project management. I'll give you some examples. When you develop a scope statement you're going to have a broad strategy and within that broad strategy you're going to already start to define what the major deliverables are to the project so you need to be thinking about in the early days how you're going to set up your project what are going to be the main deliverables how you're going to do it and then this can then flow directly into your work breakdown structure so when you're developing a deliverable based work breakdown structure it should take its lead from the scope statement so this will then lead you into a WBS dictionary uh, based on the WBS and then a schedule again based on the WBS uh, down a couple levels of WBS not all the way you don't have to keep that consistency but in the in the top levels you know levels one two and three you should have that consistency between your WBS and your schedule and similarly the consistency between your, your WBS your schedule and your budget which will then allow you to start to report on an earned value basis set up a time phase budget, you can start to get good reporting going. And then once you've got that, you've all of your WBS elements are fully defined from a scope point of view, they've got a schedule, they've got a budget, and you can allocate them to your project team members as part of your responsibility assignment matrix. So you see, you've drawn a link between the early days of setting up the scope, right down, scoping, scheduling, uh, budgeting, reporting, and allocation of tasks to your project team members. So you've got that traceability right back through the project. So another similar example, again, when you do a scope statement, you're going to define some objectives. And most of those objectives are fairly uh, intangible, um, you know, wild statements of, uh, of intent for a project. So what you need to do is you need to take those objectives and put them into your quality plan and start to put some uh, put some measures around those and set them as quality objectives for your pro for your project. You can link personal performance within the project of your team to achievement of those quality objectives. You can then also use those uh, objectives as part of your risk criteria. So when you're when you're ranking risks and when you're setting up risk mitigation strategies, you can look at what your objectives are, and then you can make decisions based on those objectives. And similarly, when you're selecting vendors for your for your project, you can look at you know what are what are our objectives, how are we measuring achievement of those objectives, does this vendor suit, what's the risk around, uh, what's the risk acceptability 
they're doing certain things in the project and then you can make your vendor selections uh, based on this. So you see we've got a nice um, traceability right back through the project. We're joining up all the parts of the project. We've got some consistency in the project. Your people can see what their, what their performance is being judged against. You can make decisions based on where you're heading in the project. So I hope that's given you a bit of an insight into project in integration. Um, in a later blog, I'll address the executing processes of the of integration. Um, goodbye for now.